I mean, for the congregation here and in thinking of, of maybe some thoughts that would go along with that. I hope that when we're done, that, that you'll, and as we go through the lesson, you'll keep a couple of things in mind. One is the scripture reading. When we look at the love that God has shown us, the love that Christ has shown us, and the sacrifice leading up to and including the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, in order that we can spend eternity with them, I, I hope that we never come to the place that we lose sight of how incredible and undeserved of a blessing that that is that we will always realize and appreciate the fact that without Christ, we have no hope. We have nothing to look forward to beyond this life here. So I hope that we take that away from the scripture reading this morning. In the lesson that we want to look at, I, I want us to appreciate that as we look at the congregation, without that gift of Christ, not only do we get salvation as a result of that gift from Christ, but we get the church. We get the congregation that we're a part of. And again, without Christ, we don't have that. And, and I think it's, it's easy for us at times that, that not thinking of it in that light and not seeing it for the blessing that it is and, and not seeing that God has given us this because He knows we need it to survive and to make it to eternity, that in doing that sometimes we don't give it the importance that, that I feel that, that it should have. So in Acts chapter 2, we're going to begin there in verse 40. And then this, this passage will just remind us a little bit of what God has designed and given to us as a result of our obedience to Him. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 40. And with many other words, He testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who were believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily and in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And, all the, Lord, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I, I know that we, we look at this sometimes when we go through this passage uh, a, a, little, a little quick, and, and we see what happened at, when the church was established. We see all this coming together. But there's a lot that God has done for us in, 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 in getting us to this point. There's a depth here that sometimes we may miss if we don't look at it. So what all was mentioned in that passage that we just read? We're looking at those who have been saved. We're looking at those who willingly open their minds and their hearts to the word of God and receive that word. We're looking at those that respond to that by being baptized. We're seeing souls added to the church, and we're seeing those souls that were added to the church continuing, continuing steadfastly together. So it wasn't that, that, that their devotion to God ended at the time that they were baptized. It wasn't that their desire to be pleasing to Him ended at that step. It was that they were going to continue to do the things that God was instructing them to do. And it's no different for, for those here that are mentioned than it is for us. We need that same attitude toward the church and the work that the God has given the church to do. We continue and see mentioned in those passages that they were together, that they had all things in common. There was sharing. They were doing these things daily. There was a gladness in their heart. And there was also a simplicity of heart. And, and we see that gladness. And so I, 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 I asked, you know, this morning as we were preparing to come here and to be together, was there that sense of gladness in our hearts that we're going to go and be able to gather with saints, we're going to go and be able to worship God with other individuals and to be able to share in the benefit that comes with that? Was that part of our thought process as we, as we even gathered this morning? And I, and I hope that it was. We, we continue to see them in their activities of praising God with the, with the Lord adding daily those that, that were being saved. And so we see again 
that, that what God has given us to us, that those are willing to be obedient to him, that they are added to that same group, to that, that same blessing that he's given to us. And so we're going to look at, at some examples this morning of how I believe that this works. And so we're going to look at this in, in, in about three different ways. And, and I hope that we will take away from this that we will see, we will see where we fit in in the congregation that we will see and examine what we bring to the work that the church does and how we can it can work to improve and to strengthen one another as we do these things together so let's turn to first corinthians chapter 12 and, and this may be a passage that is familiar to many of us but as we look at this it, it gives us an example of the way that god has put the church together it gives us an example of of kind of trying to find where it is that we fit. So as we read these passages, I want you to think about a couple of things. I want you to think about the congregation here and, and think about the part that you play in that. As, as we describe and look at the way that the physical body is tied together, compare that to the church and, and try to, to examine and see where you fit and where God has placed you here. So 1 Corinthians 12, beginning with verse 12. It's for, it says, for as the body is one and has many members, but, not all, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. You're, you're going to see that, that any time that we talk about the church, that there is a unity that comes with that. A unity by following God's word. A unity by being of the same mind based upon the wisdom that's in God's word. There's always going to be that idea of unity. That single-mindedness is always going to be a part of what, what God wants to see in the church. Verse 13, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. If, if, if you don't grasp anything else from this passage that we're reading at this time, please, please remember verse 18. And I'll read that again. But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he's pleased. The creator knows his creation. The creator, when, when, when he establishes and gives us the church, and then he places us in that based upon our obedience, he knows what we're capable of doing. He knows what we bring to that group. And he is going to place us where we can use those capabilities that he has given to us. So there, there, I, I stress that to say that there's never this avenue of there's nothing that I can do. I have no capabilities. I have no talents. God is not giving me anything that I bring to the table. That is not the truth. And that, that's not what the scripture is teaching us here. Continuing in verse 19, and if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again me, the, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much, for, <clears throat> much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on those we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given them greater honor to that part which lacks it. Now that in, in verse 25 kind of gives us a, a, a reminder of why he has done this. That there should be no schism or division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. When, when, we, when we look at that example and, and we see the way that that, that goes, we, we, we need to understand that we are a part of each other. In your thoughts as you were getting ready to gather this morning and come together here, 
Was that part of the, the joy and, and the looking forward to being together was that we're going to be with those that we are a part of. That's the way that, that, that the church has been established to be. To be. Um, when, 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 we, when we look at that description and we think about the physical body and as we were getting ready this morning and if we were able to do that without much difficulty, think about trying to do that and think for a member, which, which member would you be willing to do without? Of your physical body, if, it, if for some reason you were approaching and you say, you've got to give up one member of that body, what is it going to be? And, and sometimes we don't think about that until we have to. A few years ago, I had a, a, a pretty serious motorcycle accident. And, 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 and in, in the process of recovering from that, you don't realize how simple of a thing it is to tie your shoes until you can't use either one of your hands to do that. So it, it might be easy to stay here now and say, well, I'm right-handed, so maybe I could do without my left hand. It's easy to say that, but if that was the reality that you were going to face, so many things that we do in our daily lives just became so much more difficult. And, and, and we need to understand that 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 the reality of what God wants us to see is that none of us are, are, are we, that, that we are all needed. And, and for the congregation to be as strong and as thriving as it can possibly be, we need to understand that. We need to know each other. And, and sometimes we, we look at this and, and, and some of us may get a little bit uncomfortable, uncomfortable with that. But to really know someone else, First of all, you have to have, have an interest in that person. You have to have an interest in knowing what that person is like. And, and it takes time and it takes effort and, and it's something that we have to really work at. And, and the church needs to be setting an example for the world around us of how we do that. We're, we're going we're gonna to talk more in the lesson this evening about suffering and how we respond to that. But, but the one thing that we should always have in the church is that regardless of what we're suffering through, regardless of what we're dealing with, is a trust and an assurance that we have Christians and brothers and sisters in Christ that's going to help us through that. But we have to know each other in, in order to be able to do that. So again, it takes time, it takes effort, and it takes work. But I, I want us to appreciate that, that when we're willing to do that, it's a result of our commitment to one another, and it's an extension of our commitment to God. And, and so if, if we have come here this morning to serve and to worship God, we should have also come here this morning to serve one another and to join together in worship to him and to make that richer and to make that more beneficial because of the attitude that, that we, have, we have about that. God designed us to know one another. So what, what does this require of us? So I'm going to, the, 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 next, the next thing that will come up will be some characteristics I think it takes for, for us to build this relationship with one another. And again, some of these, you know, it may be, we may be in agreement with them right away. Some of them cause us to step out of our comfort zone sometimes a little bit. But, but it requires of us to be honest. It requires us to be honest in, in our desire to serve one another, in our desire to serve God. It takes a humility to know where we are, to, to know our capabilities, to know where we are in our relationship with God. We should be able to build a trust with one another within the church. We should be able to, to build that as Christians, that as we trust God and we take all of our, our our needs and our desires and our praise and our thanksgiving to Him, we should be able to have that same trust with one another. We need to be dependable. We need to be willing to support one another. And, and we need to even step out of our comfort level when that happens. Again, the motorcycle accident, I know that there were some men in the... And, and for those that... I recently moved um, near Madison, Indiana. But before that, the 12 years before that, I worshipped with the group at Lakeview. And that's where I was when the motorcycle accident happened. And 
Because I couldn't do much with either one of my hands when I came home from the hospital, there was one dressing that, that I couldn't change. And, and you know, the, the guys, if we're true with this this morning, things like that are not usually the thing that we raise our hands up. Yeah, I want to be a hard part to go and change that dressing for him. I know that there were men there that stepped out of their comfort level to do that, and, and, and we need to do the same spiritually, and we need to do the same for one another, regardless of what that situation is, that even if it, we may be a little uncomfortable with that, trust God to lead us to be able to help where we can help, and to do that, because why? Because we know each other. We put the work in to know each other and what each other needs, and we're going to do what we can to fill that. So we need to know that because we need to know a couple of things. The honesty and the humility comes in with there are times that we need to see and know what we need. I, I hope that doesn't sound like a silly statement because part of our self-examination is we need to know what we need. If we are struggling, we need to be able to have that trust and, and that ability to share to let others know that. But we also need to know how we can help others. And, and to study that and to know individuals well enough to know what they need and do our best to fill that. We also need to be ready to ride the roller coaster. And, and so I, I, want, I want you to, the, the next two or three bullet points here is going to bring that about. But in our relationships with one, enough, one another, within the church, there are times that's exactly what that is. There are times that, that even in our own lives, there's times that, that we're going to be up, in other words. We're going to be in a good place. And, and then there are going to be those times that we're going to be down, that we're going to be struggling, and we're going to need that, that strength and that help from others. And if, and if we live our lives through, throughout our time here on the earth as faithful Christians, we're going to be on both sides of that. We're, we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna live successfully through this life because you know you know there's there's this individual called Satan that likes to pull us down. So when when we get up to that point of, of where we're up and things seem to be going pretty good, well that's when Satan wants to take a look at that and he wants to try to pull us back down. But it's the idea of, of life itself will happen and will bring these up and downs to us. The way that we react to that is, is going to say a lot about our devotion to God, our faithfulness in Him, our trust and dependency upon Him. But we can also do that for one another. But, but, but also think about, about this last point. As a congregation, as we sit here this morning, we have members that's on both sides of that up and that down continually. So, so I, I don't know of a congregation anywhere that you're going to be able to look out and look across and at any given time, everybody's at 100%, things are going wonderful, there's nothing that's going to drag us down. That's Satan's influence. And so we're always going to find either ourselves or others that are going to be up or that are going to be down. Health issues will often take us to this same idea in this same place as well. That, that, that just when we think that, that we're about to, to, to get to the top of that hill and sit there on the top for a while, the next visit comes, the next test result comes back, and all of a sudden we're finding ourselves down toward that bottom again. If, if, if you're facing that in your life, you are not the only one in this building that's facing that. Because there are others that are either facing that, not, it may not be with health issues, it may be with spiritual matters, it may be with something else. But if, if, if you have been riding that roller coaster, and you know that very vividly this morning, you are not the only person in this building that experiences that, and many times on a regular basis. When we get to know one another and we're willing to put in that work, we're able to help each other through that. And we understand that better because now we know that we're doing that with other individuals. And so we, that's, that's the benefit that God has given us in, in, in giving us the church and allowing us to build that relationship with one another. And so we just need to ask ourselves this morning, are we willing to put in the work to, to, to know one another? Are we willing to step out of our comfort zones to be that help or to accept that help? and then to be able to, to, to thrive as a result of doing that. 
But another area I wanted to look at this was in raising the next generation. You, you can look at that as the next generation of human beings, the next generation of Christians, however you want to look at this. But some of the, the, some of the, the thoughts I want to share in this one, when I was at, at the, the last part of the time that I was at Lakeview, I was running the sound, I was, I was helping on the soundboard, and theirs is at the back of the building. And so you see a lot of things coming in, coming out. And, you know, it's not only the ones that maybe stayed up too late on Saturday night or falling asleep during the lesson. You do see that sometimes. But it's also the other things. Just this idea of, of, not, of, of, of knowing each other is a part of that, but just observing what, what others are going through and, and just to raise that next generation. So we're going to read the verses that we have up there, and then I, I want to make some comments on that. But let's go back to Proverbs first. We'll go to Proverbs chapter 22. And, and I want us to realize the blessing that God gives us in giving us children. I, I just, I, 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 you know, there is so much involved in, in raising them. There's so much involved in, in trying to focus them and, and on all the different things that are going on that it's really possible to, to maybe overlook the blessing that they are. In, in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, it says, Train up a child in a way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I, I know that there are those that, that sometimes may use this passage in a direction that I'm not sure that it goes. But, but the, the ideal is here that as parents, as members of the congregation, as grandparents, we are setting a foundation. I know that there are those that, that like to look at this passage and say, if you do certain things, then, then you're never going to have any spiritual issues with your children. That is not what the, I don't believe that this is what this passage is teaching. I believe it is teaching our responsibility that God has given us to lay a foundation of spiritual knowledge, of spiritual love, and, and, and a love for God that, that molds them in a direction and brings them to God. And, and so we ask ourselves this morning as parents and grandparents, you don't get a pass on this because you still have influence and responsibility as well. Are we, are we doing that? Is that an active part of, 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 what, of part of our training and raising our children? And, and think of it this way. One thing that when our, our sons were, were young, that, that when it was Saturday night and it was time to try to get to bed a little earlier and try to get minds going in the right direction, we tried really hard to not say, well, tomorrow's Sunday and we have to go to church. Because what we have done when we said that was we have placed in their mind that we're not doing this because we love God. We're not doing this because it's an opportunity to serve him and to worship him and to be with other Christians we just said that going to church is something that we have to do. And that sets a perception in their minds. When we would be getting ready to do that, the, the, way to, the way that we approached that was we get to go to church tomorrow. We get to go praise God. We get to go study about him. And it sets a perception as they're preparing for that next morning of, of what it is that they're going to be involved in. That's, what I, that's just a, a small example of what I mean by setting, an exam, by, by, by setting a foundation. Let's turn to Psalms chapter 127. Psalms 127, we'll notice verses 3 through 5 there. Psalms 127, beginning verse 3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak of their enemies in the gate. I, 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 I really like this passage, the way it starts out, because it says that children are a heritage from the Lord. It's a reminder to us that God has given them to us. It's a reminder that, that, that God has placed a certain amount of trust in us, that, that we are going to establish within these precious gifts that he's given to us a foundation that points them to the importance of serving God. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And, and in Ephesians chapter 6, and to look again at the responsibility of setting that foundation of, of, of for, for them knowing where God is in importance in our lives. Ephesians 6, beginning verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and training and admonition of the Lord. So again, the responsibility of, of how, we, how we go about raising the blessings of the children that God has given to us. And, 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 and we don't have time this morning. We could, we could have spent a whole lesson on, on the, the principles that God teaches us for the home and how that works together. But these thoughts give us just the reminder of the responsibility that, that we have. And so let's go to Colossians chapter 3. And now I want to make a, 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 a few other observations along this line. Colossians chapter 3, and let's begin there in verse 18. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. I just want to briefly mention, as you look at those passages and others that we could have brought up, that, 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 there, that the fathers play a key role in, in this coming about. And, and men, when, when we are concerned about doing this well, it shows that we're concerned about setting a foundation for that next generation. It shows that we are concerned about establishing in them what, what, what it is, the, the, the people that God want them to be. So as we look at those blessings, I, I, and I, I've used the term genera generational blessings here. That, not, may, that may not be exactly true. The, the best rendering of that, but it's a responsibility that, that God has given us. It again, it's this idea of, of, building, of building that foundation that is something that they can come back to. That's, the, that's, the whole, that, that's part of the whole importance of, of setting that foundation early and often throughout their lifetimes. First of all, the time that we have with them goes extremely quickly. And, and so that, that, that window of opportunity, if we're not careful, slips away from us. So that, that places the importance upon doing that. But we want that foundation, that safe place, that understanding of, of what it means to be a child of God and have faith in Him so that when those struggles that we talked about just a little bit earlier come, if, if Satan tries to pull us away by doing those things, that foundation is there and it's like, you, you know, I, I remember where the solid ground is. I remember, I remember watching either my parents or the older generation. I, I remember seeing them come back to something that they were grounded to. And when they see that in us, then, then, then Satan loses in those instances because he doesn't pull them completely away from the truth. That foundation is there, that knowledge of there's a way of, of, of working through this and getting back on track. That's what that foundation does. It needs to be that which we come back to. And, 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 and adults here as well this morning, there's times we need to remind ourselves of that as well. There are times that when Satan is really throwing everything that he has at us, if, if we're seeing ourselves to start to move away a little bit too much, we need that foundation too. We need to get back to that foundation and that solid ground. But this morning, ask yourselves, what, what, what do our children see in us? It's not so much what they see. You know, it is important what they see when we're gathered together here. But it's even so much more important what they see at home. What do they see in our day-to-day -day lives? What do they see when, when those struggles and those troubled times come up? Where do we turn in those times and what are our children seeing when they do that? And so what are they seeing in their parents? What, what, is that, what does that picture look like? What do they see in their grandparents? I, I, I have six grandchildren, and I will say that, that there are times that there are things that happen at my house now with those six grandchildren that my two sons wouldn't have gotten away with. That's their problem. They're going to have to figure out how to deal with that now. But, but, it, it's, but it's still... As grandparents, in, in having that time with our grandchildren, if we're blessed to have that, we find ourselves in a place that we can reinforce the foundation 
that we want the parents to set. And now you're going beyond just one generation of that. Now they're not only seeing it in their parents, they're seeing it in the next generation. And at some point, they're going to put together in their head that their grandparents have been doing that a lot longer than their parents have, and they're still coming back to that same foundation. Regardless of the struggles that they've been through, regardless of what brought life has brought their way and what Satan's thrown in the they come back to that same foundation. We're pulling them back to that same point by the examples that we set, and that same point is a foundation of faith in God. And, and, and if we can instill that in them, they're going to be able to, to work through so many different things. Is it going to be easy? It's not. And, 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 and that's part of setting this foundation is we don't set our children up with a false expectation that as long as you serve God, you're never going to have any difficulties. There, there's nowhere in the Bible that represents that. You, you look at, at those that are even held up to us as examples of faith, and you look at their lives and the things that they had to go through. There is nowhere in the Word of God that says, if you'll come serve me, you will have the easiest life on this earth that you'll ever have because this isn't where the reward is. This isn't where we're looking to stay. We want to be in heaven for eternity, and that's where we want to get to. And, and so that, that's, that's, that's where we can help them the most. But it's also important that they see those same things in the congregation. We talked about that closeness. We talked about that knowing one another. As children grow up within the congregation and they see individuals go through these difficulties, we can build on that foundation as well. And it's all bringing them back to what God wants them to be. So let's look at some observations that, that I kind of saw that, that's been floating around in my head. And so... When we sit there, there's, there's always this, you know, there, there's, if you have a good number of young children, at some point somebody's going to get taken out. And, and sitting at the back of the building, there, there's times that you just see it on the parent's face that it's like, I can't believe I'm having to take my child out. And then on some of those days where children do what children do and they don't cooperate later in the service, you see that face again, and they're taking them out again, and then it's like that face is saying, I can't believe I'm taking them out again for the same thing. And, and what that is, is, you know, on the surface, we look at that and we think, oh, you know, they're, 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 they're you know, we, we see that look of tiredness, we see that look of, of frustration, but you know what? That's part of building that foundation. Having them here is part of building that foundation. It's part of what they're going to look back to at some point in their life and realize that, that even when it wasn't easy, they were here. That even when it wasn't going super well, they were here. It's part of that. That's how we get back to that. When the boys were younger, I, I filled in at a lot of different congregations in, in southern Indiana. And I was usually pretty quiet on the drive. I was running the lesson through my head and Sometimes my wife would ask me, what are you preaching on today? And I would say the family. And it was almost like either a sigh or it was like, oh, please don't. And, and the reason for that reaction was it seemed like, at least to her, that every time I preached on the family, at least one of the boys would have to be taken out. And so it was like there was almost this weird science working that, that, one, that either one or both of the boys were going to be bad any time that I spoke on the family. So I, I found that interesting because what that was was a reaction of obviously if I'm, if I'm up doing the speaking and they're, they're acting up, she's having to take care of that. But there was a consistency to that, and there, 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 but it was, it was where they needed to be. And, and so it, it just always... I got to the place that I almost didn't want to answer her question sometimes when she asked that, if that's what the lesson was on. But that, that look of a, of a tired and a weary parent's face, that may be what we see, but what we need to do is be encouraging that and be appreciating the fact that they are there and that they are setting that foundation. They're doing exactly what God needs them to do as parents. And so we need to be supportive of that, and we need, to, we need to do everything that we can to help that and to support that. And so there needs to be consistency in that. If we're going to set a foundation that's going to last and, and last throughout their lifetime, we have to be consistent with that, and they have to see that. 
they have to see in us as well as instilling in them of looking at a long-range goal. That eternity is where we want to be and we want to spend that eternity together with God in Christ. And, and that's where we want to, that's why we're working so hard to set that foundation. Is that's because we want to spend eternity in heaven together. We need to remind ourselves even when we're tired and even when it, it doesn't seem like it's going well. Just to remind ourselves that God has placed them in our hands. And he's not going to give, he's not going to place something in our hands or a responsibility to us that we cannot fulfill and do. He is there with us, and he is going to see us through that. I have, I have, I have, I have heard people say that, grand, they've said it like this, that grandchildren are the reward for not killing your own children when you're raising them. So if you're in that mode to where, where, where that thought comes across your mind, remember that, that grandchildren do carry a certain amount of reward for that. I've reminded my boys of that a few times as well. So... Um, but the last thing I want us to look at this morning is what do we learn from our singing? And, y- you know, this is, this is the, the part of the lesson that, that I hope I can explain this the way that it's been, it's been setting in my head to where it makes sense. But let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And again, probably passages that we've all heard numerous times. But Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 19. It says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And so we often use this this passage as kind of the mechanics of why we don't use instruments, kind of the mechanics of how we go about our singing. And and, and it it does do that, and, and we appreciate the fact that it does that. But I think there's also some, some deeper thoughts that, that we can get from this. And, and so let's go to Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, we'll start in verse 12. And as, as, we, as we read this, I, and again, a lot of times we go to this passage and we're trying to get to the point where it's talking about our singing. But I think we do singing a disjustice sometimes when we do that. So let's start at verse 12 and just kind of start letting some of these things run into your mind that builds up to our, our singing together. Beginning in verse 12, it says, Therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. I want to pause there just for a little bit. Because when I mentioned earlier about what were we thinking about when we were getting ready to come and gather together and worship God together, and the things that we were going to be doing... Verses 12 through 15 kind of tell us where our mind should be in doing that. And so a lot of times when we look at this passage, we, we want to talk about singing, so we don't, we don't, we, we jump down to verse 16. But really for our singing to be proper and be what God's looking for, we need verses 12 through 15 before we even get to that point. It's preparing our minds. It's, it's, it's reminding ourselves of, of the purpose of the singing, but it's getting our minds set toward God and thinking about all that he has done for us before we even get to the point of teaching and admonishing one another with those songs. It's, it's, it's so much more active than just trying to follow the notes. It's this avenue of, of, of becoming something fuller than that because of the preparation that we have done in order to do that. In verse 16, it continues, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thankfulness was mentioned numerous times within that passage, and it ties into our singing. I, I don't know about you, but I am so ready for spring. I know we're going to hit cold weather between now and then, but, but it was mentioned in the prayer this morning of, of the sunshine and the warmer temperatures and, and, 
things that, that you know, we, that time of year when things come back to life and, and God in his blessings and his mercy reminds us of his control over his creation and, and we get excited about that and we get thankful for that, that thankfulness needs to be a part of our singing as well. It's a blessing that God has given us and if we're going to sing praises to him, then it needs, to, it needs to be a part of that. And, and I, I will be, you know, I'll be honest, I do, I do enjoy singing, I do enjoy the music, I enjoy the ability that God has given us to hear that. And the closer the harmony gets, I, I mean, I, some of you may think I'm geeking out here a little bit, but the, the closer that harmony gets, it, it, it almost, you know, it almost runs that chill up your spine or, or that idea of goosebumps. And, 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 and when that happens, it's, it's a time to think about the way that God has put our bodies together to work and given us hearing to the point that we can hear all of that. But, but I, I, I think it goes even deeper than that. Look again at the, the things we looked at in this passage. A part of that and getting us to that point is thinking about tender mercies, it is thinking about the kindness of God and the kindness that we should have to one another, meekness, long-suffering, helping each other through that. Have we ever thought about the fact that our singing may very well be helping someone that's here that's suffering through something, that the teaching that we're doing in that song or, or the fact that we're able to join that singing together may be giving them the shot in the arm that they need to get through what they're struggling with. I don't know about you, but sometimes the, windy, the Wednesday night time to come together for Bible study and singing, that's what I refer to it as is a shot in the arm because to me that's what it is. We've been away from each other since the first day of the week, and sometimes if we're not making that effort to get to know one another, we're not contacting one another, we've been out there on our own trying to go up against Satan and all that he's doing to us. We need that shot in the arm on Wednesday so we can make it to Sunday and then to, and then to be back again. But do, do we think about singing being able to do that? The bearing with one another, the love, the peace of God, and, and the one body and being thankful to be a part of that. And, and, and so, you know, to close the thought on the singing, what else is here? Singing is, if, if, if we're allowing the word of Christ to dwell in us richly, the way the scriptures tell us to, singing is a way that we can share that with other people. Singing is a way that, that when we gather together and we do that, it's a way that, that we can demonstrate to those around us and encourage in them by sharing the love that we have for God. It tells us that we are teaching and admonishing one another, and that's why we sing hymns and spiritual songs, because we want to teach each other spiritual things. And, and, and so it's, it's that grace in our hearts to the Lord that, that builds upon that and makes that even more, and the thanksgiving that, that goes to God. Okay, I, I got one slide early. There, there, there is still just, just a, a, a little more to that. But it's an opportunity to, to praise God together. Have we ever thought about what a blessing that is, as being a part of a congregation of the Lord's church, is the ability to praise God together? Again, I, I, I hope that in some of our preparation to be here this morning that that, that entered into our thought process. And, and where I think that, 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 at least to me, that the singing goes a little bit deeper than we normally think. Even if we gathered together and we all sang in unison and we all just sang the leading part, there is still a great edification and teaching that goes on there because it shows our single-mindedness. It shows our ability to focus upon God and his word and then to sing and teach that word to each other. But then as we add the additional parts... It, it, it becomes a fuller, a fuller experience. And so it kind of builds a completeness that God allows us to hear and to share with one another. And I, I really don't believe that that's happened by accident. I, I believe that it had been part of, of God's design and, and why it's important to him that we do that. But I think it also reminds us of where we can get to as a congregation. If we are able to, to experience that singing in a way that builds with, with praising God, our thankfulness to Him, we're teaching one another. If we're able to see that in our singing, we should be able to see that the same thing can happen in the congregation in the other areas that we've talked about this morning. 
And so as, as, as we engage in that singing, as we, as we continue to look at those things, I hope that we'll, we'll maybe think of that in, in a little bit deeper way. But as, 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 we, as we get ready to, 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 to close the lesson this morning, I want to leave you with a few questions. And, and these are just questions that it's not a quiz. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'm not going to take up papers or anything like that. But I just want us to close with some clear questions that we need to ask and that you, you should ask yourselves about the congregation here. So when you look around, when you examine, what do you see in the congregation? And again, I don't know these answers. These answers are yours. But do you ever stop and think about that? As the elders work to, to move the work forward here, do you look to see how, how their goals fit in what they're seeing with the congregation? And so do, do, we, do we take a look at that? What strengths and weaknesses do you see? And I'm not talking about pointing out weaknesses in a way of complaining or anything like that. It's just an assessment of, of where you see things are. But here's, here's the other side of that. This is why when we work at, look at weaknesses, it's not in a way to complain. Because the other side of that is, if I'm seeing a weakness, the next question I need to ask myself, what can I do to help? Is that my spot? Is that my part of the body that I can jump in there and I can help and I can help strengthen that? The, that's when the evaluation and looking at that starts to mean something. What do you appreciate? When you look at the congregation, when you look at this blessing that God has given us, what do you appreciate? And, and, and it could be, the, the list of that could be incredibly long. But again, sometimes we don't appreciate those things and we don't take the time to look at them. So what is it about the congregation that you appreciate? And then I would also add this one. Why, and, and it... I think they're two different things, but they build on each other. What am I thankful for? What am I thankful for as I look at the congregation? And then this is the one that we all need to ask at some point. Why am I here? Why did I set aside this time? There, there's, there's any number of things that, that we could be doing during this time. Why did I set aside this time out of my life? to gather together with the saints here and to worship and praise God. And, and, and I think we really need to take the time to answer that. It's not just an empty question of, of, of going through that and giving the pat answers. Well, I'm doing that because I'm a Christian. I'm here because of, what does that mean? What, what, what is it that you appreciate about being here that causes you to be here this morning? If we can get better understandings in some of those areas, we find ourselves becoming a stronger and, and a more helpful member of this group. And that's why we want to go through that and to ask those questions, because we want to be able to help one another get to heaven, and we want to be able to make this congregation as strong as it can possibly be. I, I appreciate your attendance this morning. I appreciate your attention. To the lesson. I know that we didn't speak a lot specific about, uh, about the plan of salvation, but we did see there in Acts chapter 2 that those that were hearing the word, that were believing the word, we find that they were baptized. We look at other examples in the scripture and we find those that lay hold of salvation, that upon, upon hearing the word and believing that word, upon confessing their belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, upon repenting their sins, and upon being baptized for the remission of their sins, we find that, that God's word tells us that those individuals are saved. If you haven't done that yet, we want to offer that opportunity to you this morning. We also find that, that sometimes through the struggles that Satan in this life brings our way, that sometimes we misstep, sometimes we kind of drift away from, from where God wants us to be. But his grace and mercy is still there and that he tells us that we will repent of those things, ask his forgiveness, that he will forgive us of that. And if that is something that's been done in a, a public nature that needs to be taken care of, we would, whatever that need is, we would urge you to do that while together we stand.